Welcome to Coastside Poetry. Thanks to those of you who've zoomed in and those who are watching on YouTube. We meet either physically or virtually on the second Tuesday of every month to celebrate spoken poetry. I'm Diane Lee Mumi, and Steve Long and I are your hosts this evening. Our featured poet event is being recorded and streamed live onto YouTube as we speak. So anyone can look at it later. We'll be posting the link on our website, coastsidepoetry.org. This evening, we welcome Poet Laureate Emerita of Livermore, Connie Post. Connie served as the first laureate. Um, oh dear, I didn't write the years down. I'm sorry. <laughs> her, work, her work has appeared in Calyx, Cutthroat Magazine, Comstock Review, River Sticks, and many, many others. Her awards include the Leah Cura Award, the Sejura Award, and the Crab Creek Review Poetry Award. Her first full-length book, Floodwater, won the Lyrebird Award. Her second full-length collection, Prime Meridian, was named a distinguished favorite in the Independent Press Awards. Her two 2023 collections include Between Twilight by New York Quarterly Books and Broken Metronome by Glass Liar Press. And now please welcome Connie Post. Thank you, Diane, for that um, gracious and wonderful introduction. And thank you to you and Steve who put so much work into this and having been a host for a long time, I really appreciate how much work it takes and how the community that you curate is so important. So thank you to everybody for being here. And I just wanted to show you um, my, this is Between Twilight, this is the cover and I'll be reading from that first. And then secondly, because I'm happy to have Chai. So this is my PSA for everybody. If you ever see a ton of floaters and or like a shade that goes over any part of your eye, get your butt to a retinal specialist right away. Because um, getting in within 48 hours is uh, determines a lot about the success of a surgery. If you wait too long, it's less successful. So that's my eye health PSA. Thanks for telling us that, Connie. It's it's good. Oh, she um, just said we're back and streaming fine, so I think we're okay. You gotta give me the go ahead, Diane. Okay. Well, I guess I just need to know from Steve whether the re the intro that I did already is something you can patch in. Um, you say, go ahead when you're ready, you're clear to go. So I think he's saying we're clear to go. So I'm going to go ahead and go if it's okay. Okay, well, and I'm just assuming that he's going to be able to patch in the intro that I've already oh, given. Yeah. To he you. said I can make it work. The stream never saw it. I'll edit it later. You're the bomb. Oh, Steve. great. Excellent. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Good. Okay, okay. I'm going to meet myself. Okay, cool. All right. All right. So now we're going to start. I guess a there's a lot of poems or some poems in between Twilight that I'm starting with, as I said, that are about the body. And I think as you mean, most of us know at this age, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong in the body. So this one is about my husband who had um, surgery in his neck when in the um, many years ago in 2009. Um, it's called fusion. They will take out the bad disc and clamp the space between. The bones will be one, your spinal cord finally protected. There will be no way to measure the fallout, the inventoried items that what they will take from the body. They will make last minute decisions when they get in there. There is no talk of how you bent your neck to kiss me on our first date, how it was all fluid then. Each moment held apart by measured spaces. Three days after you were home from the hospital, I think of those two vertebrae, once separate, now fused, slowly getting to know one another, the surfaces absolving one another as if there was anything to forgive. I'm going to switch gears. Sometimes the glasses help, sometimes they don't. So I'm going to throw some glasses on, see how I do. So I'm going to read this one kind of partly for irony, because when in uh, about five or six years ago, my husband had a bunch of retinal tears, which aren't as bad as the detachment. But he went through this whole crisis. I'm like thinking, wow, I'm glad I didn't have to go through that. And here I am. But this one's called retinal tear. The night before the operation, you go to the piano in the dark and play soft melodies with your eyes closed. You tell me you need to know that if you lost your sight, you could still play. 
The notes drop from the keyboard to the floor, inside the cupboards and beneath the bed. I pick up each one, hold them in my, in my hands and take them back to you, but I am too late. You are already asleep. I stand over you and make sure you are breathing steadily and the lamp is off. Our room fades to a shadow of its former self. In the weeks that follow, I hear you after midnight playing those same incandescent chords, each one escaping like a refugee in the dark. This will be one more about the body. I have about three autoimmune diseases and I find the whole concept about autoimmune diseases both kind of terrifying and fascinating, but as you, probably most of you know, that it's a way of the body kind of doesn't recognize it and it turns against you. Autoimmune. One part of the body turns against the other, reacts as if an enemy has invaded. The war against friendly fire goes on for years, possibly decades. One doctor after another gives pills and doses unrecognizable to your broken mouth. Late at night, you read one medical article after another, trying to understand why the armed forces attacked a sovereign place in the body. You toss and turn, the siege goes on, you sleep, you love, you banish yourself from your own bed. You watch yourself line up words and sign your mind, a small army encroaching from afar. The next several poems I'm gonna read uh, have to do with some, some, tra some childhood trauma, so content warning, but I was, um, estranged from my siblings for a long time. And I, I read a lot about estrangement at the time. And one of the things I found interesting was that at any given time in the United States, 27% of the population will be estranged from somebody in their family for some reason or another. So this is called estrangement. It's not like it happens suddenly. You step off a curb and agree to take a little time away. Maybe take a trip to another city. You look out the window of the bus as the streets pass by. A few weeks go by, a small building collapses. Then it's months and a road buckles and the signs reroute you to a small town. A metal bridge sways in the distance. You're not sure you can cross it again. You live in your house made of clay and sin. Every day the river runs higher to the underside of the bridge and soon 20 years of silence has passed. You watch a burning city from far away and notice a pigeon flying towards you gaining speed, pulling the sky's edges with it, finally landing, carrying its message to an unmarked grave. This one um, was about a lie I told when I was a child that I thought about for a long time. The lie. When I was in second grade, I told a girl on the playground that I lived in the hills surrounding our town. I told her I lived with the wild animals and I slept under a tree each night. For decades, I never understood why I told that lie. For decades, I forgot her name. Now, when I think about my father and his shadowy exits and entrances into my room, I think I was trying to tell her about claws and teeth and the sound of growling that came from behind a tree. I was trying to tell her that I understood the sound of brush rustling in the distance and how a small girl figures out how to hide in abandoned caves learns how to stay still so not a creature can hear you breathe. These days, I scatter blessings and dry leaves amongst the morning wolves. And morning is M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. This one is called Citadel. It's also about the body. If there's a lot of trauma as a child, sometimes people kind of disengage themselves from the body or leave the body. Technically, it's called dissociation, but there's a lot of other ways to describe it. This one's called Citadel. This is, I was, I kind of meant to say there's a way you kind of disown it for a while. This is not your body. It does not belong to you. It is not the one that left the sallow rooms of home circa 1980, never to return. This is not the body who entered the hallway of a college dormitory and knew not a soul who carried English books like a soldier carries ammunition. This is not the body that left the same college town pregnant with a son with a man you knew would someday leave. This is not the body who gave birth and bid farewell to a womb who carried two babies. This is not the body who falls into anesthesia and counts stitches like shame. This is not the body you return to each murky dusk. 
This is the body you were told to smite. This is the body you hid inside. This is the body you cradled. This is the body that knows the sound of a belt removed before a beating. This is the body that knows how to leave like a song rising from nothing, like music leaving a cathedral. Then this one um, is called River Call. I visited AWP last year, which is really close to where sh the Chehalis River, what an hour. And uh, here's a story about that river called River Call. You took your boat out on the Chehalis River and caught sturgeon with your brother who was dying of pancreatic cancer. I think of you, Father, holding up the prehistoric looking fish, your hand in its mouth and that half smile, half sneer. After twilight, you took us inside the cabin, put aside your cores, cut the meat from the bone and sawed through the coarse skin. You spoke to me through gritted teeth. You told me that soon the waters would be too heavily fished and there would be too few sturgeon. You told me your own father used to take you fishing before 5 a.m. after a beating from the night before. For years after you climbed out of our bunk beds, you left at dawn with a car full of whiskey and drove to the dark lake near our home, searching for your ancient self as if the fish were still hiding from you in that deep sandy bottom. At the time, when I was in eighth grade, I did keep this, I kept this, these diaries. They're still in the garage somewhere. But when I was in eighth grade, I kept a list of everyone I hated at school in my diary. Occasionally, if someone was nice to me, I'd cross off their name. In winter, I discovered that my mother went through my diary and she told me I've never seen a child with so much hate. And she shook her head and walked away. At home, I often beat up my older sisters I hid in my bunk beds. I cut the eyes out of my dolls. She has such a bad temper, they would say in other rooms. I didn't understand it either. My father loved me so much he couldn't leave me alone. So much that I was sequestered into the slanted rooms where all the doors disappeared. Sometimes when I kicked holes in the walls, my father would patch them up for me. I merely had to hand him the spackle and he would smooth it all away. I can no longer find those old diaries. I have no lists, just a box in the garage with some loose blank pages and a doll I never named. I'll read a couple more from Between Twilight. When I was 18, I had a boyfriend who then became my first husband, who later became my first husband, but there was an amazing woman named Rita who became like my real mother after that. And even after my first husband and I divorced, she became... She was like my real mom until that she passed in um, 2017. This one's, and I, I had helped uh, the, take care of the estate. So this is the song, the poem called Dwelling. The money for the house sale landed in your bank account today. I saw the dollar figure and thought nothing of but a small yellow house down a long gravel road in Yuba County. I've saved all your paintings and the portraits you did not finish. I've saved all the letters your parents wrote to you in the 1950s. I don't visit your gravesite often enough. I trip over the divots when the grass is wet and land face forward in places I'm not welcome. I saved the last $7 from your wallet. It's the only part of your estate that has not been inventoried. I called the water company to cancel your account. and They told me the new family is already there. I see them waiting. I see them washing their hands in your stainless steel sink. I see them opening the front door when the sun comes up. I see them stacking firewood for the long winter ahead. I'll close with uh, Between Twilight for a poem um, about my daughter. So many of you on Facebook know that I post pictures of Jake, who's now just nine. And this is when I found out uh, that Erica, my daughter, was pregnant when she was 26. It was very unexpected. To my 26-year-old daughter, you are sitting in front of me two days before my hysterectomy, telling me you are having a baby in July, asking questions only the moon can answer. The wooden grain in the kitchen table runs in the same direction as our conversation. We sort through a thousand ifs as the kitchen light flickers. 
I move a half empty glass away from surgery instructions that tell me no food past nine, only a sip of water, no jewelry, no aspirin. I am telling myself I will be fine. All surgeons know how to remove items from the body, tumors, blockages, hidden prophecies. I am bidding farewell to a knotted house of cells ramshackle after years of being empty. But it was your first home, your first warm universe void of Saturn or satellites, where you held out your intricate hand and stepped into your first dance with gravity. You making your own constellations. You forming, emerging as celestial bodies do. Quietly changing the galaxy as if to say, I'm here. And boy, was he ever. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to switch to Broken Metronome. And I want to show you this cover again. My sister, oldest sister, uh, Paula, did this cover. She's an excellent artist. Uh, she's mostly a nature artist, but we had wanted for years to collaborate on something and then we ended up doing that so this book is about my brother named cliff who sadly died in april of 24 of last year so it's in a year plus of parkinson's his particular form of parkinson's was very virulent and everybody's journey is very different but it was a very very difficult journey and i couldn't really i just had a i mean we all grieve differently and usually i'm a big crier but i just kind of felt shut down but i wrote and wrote and wrote and so it was what was born of that was this book and so i'm going to read i think i have a little bit of time some poems to honor him and i think that i'm hoping the book has already um, helped people who are kind of it's really both for people with parkinson's but also caretakers it's really a book more about helping somebody with the end of life and the long goodbye so the first poem in the book is called underwater at swim lessons in the community pool, we clung to the same ledge, kicking our feet, listening intently to our instructor while elbowing each other under the water. I watched the teacher. I watched her so intently that when I looked over to my right, you were suddenly submerged. I didn't understand until then what it meant to come close to drowning. I saw your face and maybe you saw mine. You sank lower and lower until a swift hand plunged in and pulled out and pulled you out of those chlorinated depths. You came out sputtering. We never spoke of it after that. I didn't think of it much until today, until I signed into the front desk of the nursing facility. I poked my head into your room, watched the way the Parkinson's pulls you under. I sit by your bedside. This time my whole self plunges in. This time we both hang on. My sister, my second oldest sister is researching. She's uh, actually in the science field and she's been doing a lot of research on Parkinson's, but it's really frustrating to have fewer little answers. Scientists, this is called searching. Scientists search for a cause. All I can do is comb the literature like a student cramming for exams, trying to map the way back to your first symptom. How can we know what decisions a body will make for us? How can we know how long a mutation will keep a secret? How can we know where your mind is when you no longer speak? All I can hold on to is the memory of your hand in mine when we first went to Sunday school and believed in everything. Cliff was only a year. We had five kids in four and a half years and Cliff was very close to me. It was only a year, um, a year behind me. So we were a year apart. So we were really close and we fought a lot. Um, there's all these terms when somebody in your family has a disease that you start to learn and have that take on a lot of meaning. And you're kind of both like learning, but are, you know, grieving at the same time. So this one's called Parkinson's glossary. Ataxia, a movement disorder marked by loss of balance. You fell again today. Dementia, a decline in memory of intellectual functioning. Friends ask, isn't he too young for that? Facial masking. The face is immobile with reduced blinking. I wonder what you are thinking. I hope you can hear me. Hypokinesia. Slower diminished movement. I try to move slowly with you like when we practice for the seventh grade dance. Rigidity. Abnormal stiffness in a limb or other body part. I tell you to remember how you felt when you rode your bike every weekend. Dopamine antagonist. 
a class of drugs commonly prescribed in Parkinson's disease that bind to dopamine receptors and mimic dopamine's actions in the brain. You've been given everything that can be given, the doctors say. End of life care. Care given to people who are near the end of life and have stopped treatment to cure or control their disease. You, a bed and music you used to love. It was very hard when he stopped talking. My son, I have an adult son who doesn't speak at all and has never spoken, but I'm used to my communication with Thomas, him not speaking, but to have language and then to lose it. And so a lot of times Cliff's lips would be moving and he would be thinking that we heard him or we could understand what we didn't. So it was very frustrating. And so ironically enough, my brother's group home was within two miles of my son's group home. So these Saturdays were kind of going between the two. So this one's called Two Miles Apart. I drive between the two places, ignoring the gas gauge and the narrowing roads. My son in one group home and my brother in another. My son has never spoken. Autism took his language decades ago. My brother's voice fades away like a church like a church bell in the distance. I stop at a park along the way, the grass tamped down from a kid's bike, small signs of loss in its insidious tracks. I will bring my brother good food and music he likes, but, the, but he will turn away once the hospice nurse arrives. I will bring my son a Coke with extra ice and he will drink it all in a few minutes. Each time I visit, I hurry through each yellow light knowing there isn't enough time. But I make my way between these two quiet countries, finding tranquil roads with low-hanging trees and small, silent creatures who show me the way. It was quite the contrast to live through both of those experiences. I feel like, in a way, Thomas's disabilities prepared me very well to help me help my brother die. Um, this one's called Bedside. I don't count your respirations per minute any longer. I don't look at the little blue hospice book that spells out the shades of your illness. An ending is an ending, no matter how the minutes drip by. It's the middle of the week. I put on my N95 mask and sit close to you. I turn on the same soft piano music and the notes float next to the absence of our conversation. I read that dementia patients hold on to old memories. So I enter the realm of 50 years ago and take you with me. I talk about the tadpoles we used to find, the dinosaur trails we made, and the dirt in the backyard and about G.I. Joe when dying was only pretend. I think I have about five more minutes, Diane. I think, I think that's about right. Contracture which I'll describe, is a fixed tightening of muscle, tendons, ligaments, or skin and prevents normal movement or the associated body part. The nurse increased your dose of fentanyl patch today. It will take up to 48 hours to take effect. In the meantime, you continue with breakthrough doses of morphine. I think about the small gathering of trees outside your window. I wonder if at dusk they secretly tell you how to keep your limbs intact and yet learn to bend with the wind. This is towards the end. Um, towards the end called Respirations Explained from the hospice nurse. It's, a, it's kind of incredible how you develop these really intense relationships with people for this brief period of time. And then after that, you don't talk again. But I did send the book to the hospice nurse. Respirations Explained. The hospice nurse gives it a name, Shane Stokes Breathing. An abnormal breathing pattern where the patient has fast, shallow breaths, then deep, heavy ones. She explains it's the body's way of trying to correct itself when everything is shutting down. For days, we watch you fall in and out of the cadence of endings. The nurse says it's not painful, but it's hard for me to believe as I watch you fall in and out of the broken metronome of this fatal disease. I say your name quietly several times an hour, and although you don't respond, I remind myself but the literature says they can hear you even when they're unconscious. I remind you of all the times we collected daddy long legged spiders, how at times you held them in your hand, each one pushing up against an unknown surface as we all do. I think I'll just do two more, maybe three. 
the last time, so my brother and I played chess and like a lot of our games, like when we played Monopoly, usually there was some sort of a fight, Monopoly pieces flying everywhere. And sometimes it wasn't really great with chess either, but we did have these really intense chess sessions. The last time we played chess, I threw a rook at you before I stomped out of the room. We were teenagers. Now that you are gone, I can't stop thinking about your quiet approach, placing each pawn out one by one. I watch your fingers lightly touch the chess pieces, showing how you understood the intricate balance of the power of the board. I think of your fingers in the last year of your life clinging on to the bed rails, how I placed your hands gently on your blanket after you'd gone to sleep. How could we have known then that death had its own strategy? How could I have known how regret jumps over everything else, like the kings on the board, like the knights on the board? I no longer play the game. I am no longer willing to glue together broken bishops and bereft kings. I fold the chessboard the way I sometimes close a book before it's over, dog earing the pages as if I will remember the way back. Just two more. Late May visit. I went to your gravesite today. The tombstone isn't there yet. I dread that day when permanence finds me like a gray stone. I dread it like the day I waited three hours for the coroner to come and take you away. That day sticks to me like a heavy lead apron. I think it now of how I stopped the coroner just before he left and I said, can you wait just a second? I put my hand on your silent body and said, safe travels, brother. And now I wonder what light years really mean. My astronomer friend tells me the stars we see now appear as they did 4,000 years ago. How we can travel so far, but end up at the same clearing in the grass. During the time that my brother was dying, um, there was a Robin Redbreast outside the window building a nest. And I was not really very attached to it until after he died but me and the grandsons went out and looked at it a lot but it changed meaning and so this is the final poem in the book is called robin redbreast all through your illness i take i wake to the sound of birds i ignore them i don't care about the type kind species or if they are far or near i just get dressed and drive to see you Two months after you die, a robin redbreast, a redbreast robin, makes a nest in the hanging plant just outside my bedroom window. I watch her carefully. I go to the win window countless times a day and make sure everything is okay. I worry at night about the eggs and if they will still be there in the morning. I read grief books. I watch mindfulness videos. Nothing helps. It's a Sunday in June. I watch her until noon and she stares ahead doing her silent work. I see now how someone comes back to you oftentimes in a small shelter just beyond your reach. Thank you. I'm gonna copy paste. I'm just gonna um, put in the notes if you wanna um, contact me for a copy. I have signed copies. I'm doing a two for special tonight. So if you want to get both books for 20, that's fine. Or any two for 20, it's fine with me. Just email me. My email's in the chat. If you'd like to just email me if you want to do that. But thank you all for coming and for listening and getting through my visual difficulties. It, it, it went okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Connie, for showing up. I, I, I can only imagine what it must feel like. You did a wonderful job. And thank you for posting all your information in, in the chat. That's, that's thank great. You. Thank you so again. I'm going to suggest um, first that Steve remove the spotlight from me and that then that we um, unmute and make some noise for Connie. So. Um, Thank you so, so much. What a wonderful community. Beautiful. Um, Thank you. Wonderful. Yes. So moving. Connie. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. And I was, I think I haven't read, I've read a couple of times Broken Metronome. Um, it's it's hard to, to, you know, to go through that journey again, but I, I made it through. So I, and I'm glad that the book's out there mm -hmm. for him as a tribute for his life. I just ordered it from Amazon. I knew I would want to have your work close at hand. Your reading was fabulous. Thank you, Bob. 
such such a gift to have um, you know records of of the journeys of people who've gone. When you end up remembering these things too from childhood that kind of come up as you, I, I tried to yeah, take a lot of the good and, stuff. And then amazing. just to know that it's like, it's there to read. Yeah. I yeah. need it. <laughs> you know? yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm looking forward to everybody's open mic poems. Yeah. Um, if anyone would like to say anything oh. more, well, um, I'll take a couple minutes and then I just want to say a quick thank you to Connie. I'm I'm so glad you were able to read tonight with both eyes open. No, thank you. Um, you saw me a trying a time. Times, I yeah. Think. Yeah. yeah. If you and hadn't I'm, said I'm, anything, we never would have known. Oh really? Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Just really, grateful to hear like... the new work. Thank you. Especially yeah. and always the stories from the other books. Yeah. I have yeah. to leave um unexpectedly yeah. early, but oh, thanks take care of everyone. Thank you, Gail. Thanks for coming, Lisa. Wow. I, um, you would, you would been, never know that you had the eye uh, uh, problems. You read so well. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. Because there was a couple of times it's so weird because like sometimes it's fine and then like suddenly it just blurs out. So you kind of have to adjust. But yeah. And you don't know when that is going to be. No, I don't. It just suddenly happens. Yeah. So yeah. Lisa's just, not boring. I just wanted to say, <laughs> Connie, that your poems are, are so so heartrending and they're poems that I will remember for a very long time. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. That's very difficult times to share. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. I love your I love your poetry. Always have. And I'm well, gonna yeah, order I'm the two books. You, but uh, I really order the, yeah, thank I'm gonna you. order the two books from you. I'll do that later. Yeah, you know how to get a hold of me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Connie, the, the one on estrange, Dale Lossman, the, the one on estrangement was really, I, I've never heard any, anyone as, on that subject as good as that. Thank you. It's painful stuff. Yeah. And also, I, I think the, the childhood abuse, you know, that was really good. Thank really, you. really good. Uh, question. Um, yeah. On the estrangement, so were you estranged? I, I mean, I don't want to be personal, but were you estranged from these brothers and sisters yes, for and, a long then, time. and then when he started dying that I decided that we just all made a decision that we have to put aside some of the stuff and and I came back and he I, we all we feel like he got us back together we like feel like mm-hmm. that's, he, he helped mm-hmm. us come back together so when we're all back together all my sisters and I again so it's a wow very emotional I cried for months because it was so hard for so long but I'm glad we're back together yeah. Especially yeah. appreciated your line about the doorless room. Uh, oh yeah, totally relate to that. Thank you. Yeah, right. there's a there's a quote I heard. I don't remember what it was from, but they said our lives become defined by who we're trapped in rooms with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um. I have broken metronome, but hearing you read them, it, it was just breathtaking. Thank, Thank you so you much. Me. And I appreciate your Facebook comment. That was super nice of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing. There's so much suffering and uh, pain and wisdom. And uh, you, you read so well. And thank you so much for oh, sharing. Thank you. That, that keeps me going as a poet. Thank you. I, I have, I'm a big believer in the William Stafford that I have made a parachute out of everything broken. I have woven a parachute out of everything broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a very wise poet. Very, very, yeah. Mm. Well, we'll stop recording in a moment. Um, those of you um, in the Zoom room, if you'd like to take part in the open mic, um, stay online if Zoom doesn't throw you off again. Um, Those of you watching on YouTube, um, please join us next month on our second Tuesday when we will welcome East Bay poet Tony Alderondo. So um, thanks again for joining us at Coastside Poetry and for helping to keep the lamps of poetry burning. You know, I